This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. Secret societies and brotherhoods like the Illuminati, Freemasons, and the Council on Foreign Relations, or even the Federal Reserve, have been at the basis of alleged conspiracies surrounding the movements forging a one-world order. Men like Dr. Adam Wieshaupt, Albert Pike, Moses Mordecai, otherwise known as Karl Marx, or even John D. Rockefeller and the Rothschilds, and of course the Bilderberger Group, have all been accused of manipulating economic trends and conditions. They've even been accused of financing much of two world wars. Admittedly, conspiracy theories are suspect, but the Bible is clear. A one world order is indeed coming, and it will mark the population for controlling your livelihood. However, are today's present geopolitical conditions in agreement with what the Bible says? Is the stage set, or are there violent changes on the horizon? Stay with us as we explore today's world trends with the prophetic statements of your Bible. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well, hello and again welcome to another international telecast of the Armor of God. Good to be with all of you once again. Glad that uh, you could spend some time with us and hopefully you'll spend the whole half hour here exploring the Word of God and hopefully you'll also get your Bibles. I've got quite a few scriptures to go through and I'm sure it'll be more meaningful to you if you can kind of follow along with me. You know, I think all of us would agree that mankind's history has really been a legacy of catastrophe after catastrophe. And so often, these catastrophes lend to this notion, for some, that, you know, we kind of get paranoid about the end of the world. It seems, especially if we're in areas where these catastrophes hit, it seems like it is the end of the world. I mean, I think many of us can remember the landing of Hurricane Katrina down there in New Orleans, when so much damage and destruction occurred to those people down there, so much devastation, death, agony, and then of course here recently the landing of Hurricane Sandy that slammed into New York and made such a, such a whole host of destruction there and devastation that people experienced the loss of their homes and families and personal items. And if we go back further in history, in the 20th century, we can remember World War I, of course, and all the devastation in that part of the world that that particular World War brought upon those people, along with guys like Stalin, who were really atrocious in the atrocities that they had employed and, and impacted so many people with. I mean, if the truth were known, Stalin is responsible for killing more people than Hitler did even. And then the Chinese and what they did to their people in leading up to World War II, which many of us remember in that mid part of the 20th century as to be, for all intents and purposes, the world kicking back on tyranny and attempting to hold back this maniacal individual called Hitler who attempted to try to usher in his millennial reign of the superior race upon mankind. And then of course we, we can remember guys like Saddam Hussein who gassed his people and Idi Amin before him and so many others. I could go on and on and on about the catastrophes and conditions of that we as human beings have experienced that lend to this notion that somehow, some way, somewhere the world is going to end uh, as we know it and mankind forever will be destroyed. And I say that because of this also, that in some cases it's exacerbated, it's aggravated by people who come along, preachers, especially from the Christian ilk, who claim Jesus is going to return and the world is going to end. He's going to return on this day or he's going to return on that day. And then, of course, you add to the fact of you have documentaries on networks such as Discovery or the History Channel that cover guys like Nostradamus and his writings attempting to connect the dots of what he wrote so many hundreds of years ago with the 21st century or guys like Hal Lindsey 
and authors like him, the, the author of the late great Planet Earth booklet that he's rewritten a couple of times and added to and expanded because his dates were wrong previous when he originally wrote the book, or you remember the series Left Behind, which the emphasis on the rapture, that Christians were going to be wafted away in a protective fashion so that they could avoid the tribulations and the return, of course, some years later of Jesus Christ. All of these things, all of these things contribute to this paranoia, this sense of, of notion that, well, the world is going to end somehow. I don't know how exactly, but it's going to play out and it's going to end. And yet, you know what, my friends, let me just caution us real quickly here on this one thing, and that is what all of these preachers, speakers, prognosticators miss is one major element. You know what that element is? They forget the details of the script. That's right, the prophetic script of your Bible, of which your Bible is very clear on certain details. Let me interrupt myself real quickly, because we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before I do, let me present to you our two offers that we have today uh, to give you. And again, let me emphasize they are free. All you've got to do is dial that 888 number, 578. 8791 and ask the operator for a world in transition. Now this is a booklet about you know 50 plus pages. It's going to take you a little while to read but it does complement the program and it does provide you an opportunity to see where the trajectory of the world is going, where the trends are going because your Bible has a lot to say about the objective and the goal of where mankind is trending toward and believe it or not the things you're seeing surrounding you today are indeed right on course. You've got to get this booklet. A World in Transition certainly will be very helpful to you to put some semblance of order to what you find yourself surrounded by in these world events that we live in today. Along with that, a one-hour presentation called Closing In on Revelation 18. Got to get that one too. One hour presentation before a live audience that will also complement this presentation. And let me bring your attention to that um, website at www.cgi.org. There's a lot more information there for your perusal and consideration and certainly will be well worth your time along with taking note our special feature there of a webcasting available to you every Saturday. The times will be posted on that home page. All you've got to do is click on that cgi.org and get over there to that home page and find out the time. So one more time now that phone number 888-578-8791 and that website there displayed on your screen as you're looking at it right now, www.cgi.org. Now, let's get back to the program. You know, as mentioned, there's this notion of paranoia. The world is going to end. And as I've already illustrated, there's a variety of reasons for this mentality in so many of us. As a matter of fact, just the other day, Oh, some months ago now, I guess, I guess it is time flies when you're having fun, as they say. But I was watching Sunday television and turned on one of these very popular televangelists. has a very large ministry. He's very pro-Israel, quite frankly, and uh, does a lot of good work for the Jewish people today, to his credit, by the way. And I don't mean any criticism on this uh, in that regard. However, he mentioned something that really caught my attention. And it brought me right back to the script because this is what I'm talking about. We've got to underscore what we say if indeed we're going to say something prophetically and claim and advance it as truth. We've got to stay connected to the script. And this gentleman said something, as I say, that kind of caught my eye uh, and my attention because he was in one respect saying something that is authentic and true, that Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies in the end day. But context is king. And of course the timeline is very important too. Prophecy is much like a puzzle. You got to get all the pieces up, all the dots up on the board like profiling a serial killer. The FBI does this. You know they get all of the evidence and they put it up there on the board because you cannot deny any bit of the evidence because any little part if you miss it could cause a whole different picture to be drawn. So it's important. It's very important that you you understand that you've got to stay connected. You've got to underpin, undergird yourself with the scriptures. And so in this particular case though, though the man said true that it was, that is Jerusalem to be surrounded by armies, the fact of it was is that he indicated that it was going to be soon and that God was going to use this opportunity to display great power and strength and favor to the Jewish people and bring fire down from heaven and obliterate that army. 
And yet, my friends, the sad part about it is that though in one respect it's true, but when it happens, when the armies do surround Jerusalem, and that does indeed happen, is right at the end when Jesus returns at the Battle of Armageddon. This man portrayed differently, and so differently that, frankly, the Bible is in conflict with what he said. Notice, let me interrupt myself here and digress just for a moment, because I'm saying all this to say something else here, but in Daniel chapter 11, I want to bring your attention real quickly to illustrate to you the contrarian event that is actually going to happen prior to armies surrounding Jerusalem. Oh, armies will surround Jerusalem, but first in the scenario, as pointed out in Daniel 11, notice this, Daniel 11, chapter uh, 11, verse 40 here, uh, we read of a king of the north and a king of the south in the end times, pushing at one another. The king of the south aggravates the king of the north. He comes down like a blitzkrieg and invades the Middle East. He puts his footprint over on Ethiopia, Libya, and Egypt and takes over all of these countries. And in addition to that, he also does this. Notice in verse 41, he says this, he shall enter also into the glorious land. Do you know what the glorious land is? That's the land of what we're told today, Israel, Palestine, and characterized as the Israelis, better labeled probably the Jews. That's another story. But the point that I want to make is before what is implied by your Bible that armies surround Jerusalem and God brings fire down from heaven to obliterate them, the fact of it is, contrary to that, the reality is they, the Israelis, are going to be occupied and invaded and taken out, you see. That's quite different. And when you put that piece on the board, you have a quite a different picture of the future of the Israeli people in the coming future. So this is just one example of what I'm talking about. I want to take this opportunity to present to you a different example that will also add to, I hope, your understanding of why it is so important to stay connected to the script. We've often said, don't believe me, you believe your Bible. You don't believe Tony Booker, you don't believe Bronson James, you don't believe Mike James or myself, you believe this Bible. And we've often said that and we will continue to say it because the Bible is king in this ministry as it should be in all ministries. Turn with me just a few pages back. I'm already in the book of Daniel to hear chapter 7 for a moment. Daniel chapter 7. This is the story here of a prophecy given to Daniel, this young man who, by the way, was a captive at this time in Babylon. Babylon was invading Judah, the southern tribe of Israel. The ten tribes have already gone, long gone by the Assyrians, 120 some years before. Daniel, in the king's court of Nebuchadnezzar, a POW, basically a captive, a Jewish captive, receives this particular vision from an angel. And he goes down through some animals. You're probably familiar with the lion, the bear, and the four-headed leopard, and so on, and all of these things that are going to happen. And actually, the, the prophecy was so intense that it made Daniel sick. But at any rate, the bottom line is Daniel is assured that God is going to win out, that God's people ultimately take over the kingdom. And as I've often said, the good guys do win, the bad guys lose. That's a good, good point and a good part of the story. However, he redresses this fourth kingdom. And interestingly enough, and I want to bring your attention to this, we begin now to see some trends that hopefully and should be familiar to you as we begin to translate this almost 2,700-year writing into our 21st century. Notice this. He says here in verse 19, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Now this is a redress of the four beasts, but with a spotlight on this last one. He says here, which was di different, diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, and whose nails were like brass, which devoured and broke pieces and stamped the residue of his feet. He says here, the ten horns that were in his head, and of the others which came up before, which three fell, by the way, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And I beheld, he says in verse 21 of Daniel chapter 7, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Notice that. So much for the rapture. This beast, this power, this fourth kingdom is going to exercise power. It's going to exercise violence on Christians. There's going to be another martyrdom of Christians to the scale of a worldwide scale, my friends. And Christians are going to be martyred. They are going to be killed. As a matter of fact, as we read on here, it even talks about wearing the saints out. Wearing them out. 
That doesn't talk about so much about a rapture. That talks about the Christians actually being right in the thick of things. And I'm not saying God doesn't promise or provide protection. He does, but that's His prerogative to the select few that He may provide uh, protection to for purposes, by the way. But again, that's another story for another program. Here, though, I continue. This fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be di different, diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth. This is going to be a worldwide benefactor. This system is going to take over the whole world and put itself upon the world like a blanket. Everyone, by the way, is going to benefit from the, uh, being advantageously connected to this system. And I'm not making that up. I'll show you what, why I say that and where I'm coming from in a moment here if you just stay with me. But let me continue on here. He goes on. The Bible interprets itself. He says here in verse 24 of Daniel 7, the ten horns out of the kingdom, here it is, are ten kings. So you have ten kings, we're being told here, that pool their power with this one who essentially parlays this power to a, an effect of where this system it becomes a benefactor for the whole world. For the whole world. L let me say, do, do you see a bit of trending toward a world order? toward a one world government? Do you see any kind of evidence we can put on the board connecting some of the dots to where we can begin to see some inklings, some sparkling of a United Nations world? I'm just saying, just saying. You need to get the offers and the booklet as, as you proceed through here because what you're going to see written by another gentleman here in a moment, uh, well, let's go there. Let's go there to Revelation 17. And let me remind all of you, now this is written by the Apostle John, some 700 or so, 600, give or take a few years later in Revelation chapter 17. And we read here basically the same theme. And here in this particular case, we're told in verse 9 that here is a mind which has wisdom. And uh, basically we're told... Is a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the mountain sits. And of course, we understand that Rome is built on seven mountains, we, or hills. We also understand that Rome was the city of dominance and in power at the time John, the apostle, in 90 about A.D. or so, was writing the book of Revelation. So we understand that Rome was a very prominent and dominant city, not only city, but also representative of a government that essentially ruled that whole Mediterranean area. And I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the Roman Empire. But here John continues on. And he says here, uh, there were seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space. I'm not going to park there for any length of time. That Really, that one scripture there almost deserves a whole program for itself. There's a lot of thought about what that represents, whether John is talking about five emperors uh, that preceded and the one is, and we, you know, try to, some fit, scholars try to fit that in with the emperors. Others have tried to fit that in with empires, going back as far as Assyria, coming forward forward with Babylon and Persia and so on. But as I say, that, that remains for a, a, another uh, time, another period, another program perhaps. Here's my point though, because all of this dialogue, this whole narrative serves for this purpose, and that is to illustrate that there's a connection to a very evil force. Because notice here, as you proceed in this dialogue, he says in verse 11, as you get through this uh, verse 10 that I just referenced, verse 11, the beast that was and is not, even he is of the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. You see that? So this beast is connected historically. He's threaded into the history of this force, this system that has had its beginnings, its genesis, many, many years prior. And you'll see what we're talking about here. The Bible verifies even how far it goes back. By virtue of the very name, the kind of the cat is already out of the bag. The fact that it's called Babylon the Great 
illustrates, you could make the case, that it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel when God had to confound all the languages. But I get ahead of myself uh, here a little bit. Notice, though, I want to go on just to draw further connection with Daniel 7. As I mentioned, uh, John here writing some 700 years later from the uh, prophet Daniel. He says here in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 17, And the ten horns which you saw. Now what did Daniel say the ten horns were? We read ten kings. Look at what John says. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings. Which, he received no kingdom, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings. One hour with the beast. Now notice this. What you've got here is a socialistic system being described right before your very eyes. Notice in verse 13 it says here, the, uh, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. These ten are going to coalesce and combine their power, their authority, their geography, what they represent, those ten are going to combine and team up with this beast, this tyrant, which is described in other parts of your Bible as a guy who, who understands very dark sentences, he's very wily, he's very wise, he, he uses uh, economics to leverage power and to leverage influence. I don't have a lot of time to go into those details, but he's also a god of uh, munitions, he, he has the strength and the will to exercise violence when necessary. He, he's really, really slick, this guy, this, this uh, upcoming eighth who's of the seven that is historically connected to this label called the Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots, as your Bible points out. Now, to illustrate this historical connection and the resurrection of this system from a docile state of which it has been kind of simmering in the background, off the radar screen, submerged under the noise of planet Earth for many centuries, and perhaps you can even make the case maybe a millennia or so, is this now identifying connection. So if we're talking in terms of putting more pieces of the puzzle on the table or more dots on our invisible board so we can learn to connect up the evidence to all of these things, we begin to see a validation that this end time system is actually connected to Daniel 7 and the same beasts are described here by John, let me reemphasize, 700 or so years later, 700 or so years later. Turn with me, if you would. Revelation chapter 13. Notice this. Time is getting away from me. I'm not going to read it all, but I will read this just to illustrate the connection. Notice, John says figuratively in this vision, he's uh, standing upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast uh, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his, uh, his mouth was the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat. I saw his heads, that one was wounded to death, the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered at the beast. What are we saying here? What are we seeing here? Think about it. Connect the dots. They're on the board. We've got a beast. All these beasts are listed. Who is the lion? It's Babylon, back in Daniel 7. Who is the bear? It's Persia, Daniel chapter 7. Who's the leopard? It's Alexander the Great and the Macedonian Greco empires. Connect the dots. It's a Greco Romanish Babylonian world ruling empire that's going to be socialistic in its nature, dominant in the world. It's going to exercise power over people, nations, tongues. Read it there, Revelation 17, verse about 15. I'm not making these things up, my friends. These are dots on the board, pieces of the puzzle that are on the table. And we are now being surrounded by movement of great, great movement, great inertia, great initiations and programs of initiations to be what you could say trending toward bringing all nations together under one world rule through economics, communications, and of course political power. 
Notice the definition of socialism from good old Webster. A theory or system of social organization, matter of fact, we'll put this up on the screen for you, in which the means of production and distribution of goods are owned and controlled collectively or by government. In Marxist theory, the stage following capitalism in the transition of a society to communism, characterized by the imperfect implementation of collectivist principles. You get that, my friends? What you're seeing around you is not an out-of-control, helter-skelter mishmash of events and conditions. As daunting as it may appear to be to some of you, the fact is you are on line with the script. And as unnerving as that may seem to be for many of you, and as I've often said, Nostradamus has nothing over the Bible. It's so unfortunate that so many of these tele-evangelists just don't stick with the script. It's far more exciting, far more real, far more self-actualizing when you just stick with the script. We are moving toward a socialistic environment, but there is one major, one major obstacle standing in the way of the socialization of planet Earth. And do you know what that is? Because until that obstacle is out of the way, neutralized and removed, the world is going to be hampered in the development of this time of the Gentiles. You know what that obstacle is? It is the decline and ultimate fall of the United States of America. Friends, get the material that we're offering. A world in transition. You've got to get this booklet. You just have to get this booklet. It will go into far more detail than what I've just presented to you uh, this, this morning or on this particular program at whatever time you're watching it. Do dial that number, 888-578-8791. And don't forget about that one-hour presentation closing in on Revelation 18. I didn't even get to Revelation 18, but therein lies the underscoring proof that the dot that we're talking about is a benefactor, a world-ruling empire that that the world mourns its downfall. The world is saddened by the fact that it's taken off the board. You've got to get this one-hour presentation of Revelation closing in on Revelation 18. Read it. Get an inkling of what Revelation 18 really is describing. I know it's describing the downfall of Babylon the Great, but read in between the lines on how great Babylon the Great was. That number, 578-8791. And don't forget about that website, triple dot CGI. Dot org. Friends, this is Bill Watson reminding all of you, you keep on that armor of God so that you may stand in these evil days. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.